think my uh, official title, title is Director of Natural Resources here at Beaver Book Association. And I first came to Beaver Book Association, I'd like to say uh, I jumped at the opportunity, but I really almost literally had to have my arm twisted. Why is that? Uh, by, well, well, I I, um, I grew up in Pepperell, and that was my town. I had, I had no intentions of leaving yet. One of the requirements of taking this job was I had to live on the property. As it turned out, that was no hardship. Uh, living in the Cape at the bottom of Brown Lane is probably one of the best places in the world to, to live. And uh, I had two daughters that uh, enjoyed a number of years there as well. When did you move here? I, mo uh, I, I went to work uh, for Beaver Book Association in April of 1975, and I, I moved here sometime in 70, late 76. Uh, I, I, I don't remember, maybe, maybe, maybe September or something like that in did, 1976. Did you know about Beaver Brook already? Sort of. I'm trying to think. Uh, my family had a little piece of land that was originally Worcester land down down on the Nissitissit River in in, in Pepperell. And when that was formed, the, the, when the Nissitissit River Land Trust was formed in uh, December of 1968, so this would have been sometime in 1969, I was invited to uh, a, a a meeting of the Nissitissit River Land Trust, which was held at the barn at. Uh, the Brown Lane Barn at, at Beaver Brook. That was my first real introduction to to uh, Beaver Brook. Actually, it was even before that. In 19, the summer of 1964, I worked an internship with uh, Professor J. Harry Rich from the Forestry, a retired professor emeritus of forestry from the University of Mass. And he had a very large tree farm over in the uh, Nashville River in, in Groton. It's now uh, the only uh, state-owned uh, tree tree farm, but it's a, a five-acre tree farm over there on the banks of the of the Nashua, and so I had uh, quite an opportunity to to work with him and on that tree farm. So I was stacking pulpwood one day, and this very handsome, well-dressed guy uh, came in and uh, sat in his car, and pretty soon Professor Rich came in. They got into this other gentleman's car and off they went. And when they came back, I, I asked Mr. Rich, who was that uh, uh, dashing fellow? And it turned out to be Tudor Richards. I'm trying to think of the exact words that uh, Professor Rich used, but he said uh, something to the effect of, he's a brilliant forester. He used to be the forester in Cheshire County for the Cooperative Extension Service, and he was just hired to become the director of this nascent little organization, conservation organization up in, in, in Hollis. Never said the word, but it turned out that Tudor, who I got to know very well, you know, in, in the f subsequent years, was that first director of this nascent, na nascent organization in, in uh, Hollis Weaver Book Association. So it, it didn't mean anything to me at that, at that time. But once I saw the the barn at, in 1969 in in that uh, initial meeting of the Nisitis River Land Trust, I subsequently went on to become uh, president, and I have been for 30 years of the Nisitis River Land Trust. Wow. Yeah. Okay. What's your background? Oh boy. Educational. Uh, education wise, <laughs> uh, I I I have a degree in park management. I always intended to go into park management until I uh, national park. And until I found out that in order to be successful and climb the ladder in the National Park Service, you had to be be willing to move all over the country. For instance, you know, you know if a GS-8 position opened up in, in uh, the, the Everglades, they would give you an opportunity to, to bid on that job. If you, if you, if you were award, awarded it and didn't take it, you had one more chance and then your career was essentially stalled at a GS-7 where you literally are, and, and I didn't want that. So then I got a degree in history because I thought I'd be, a, I'd be a history teacher. And the then uh, president of Beaver Book Association was a dear friend of mine, George Kaisen Pepperell, who was also on the Conservation Commission with me. Uh, he's the one that almost literally twisted my arm to come up here because the then uh, executive director, who was also a forester, uh, was 
getting getting done to go off and complete his uh, PhD work. Kurt Olson, who happens to be the uh, the former husband of Freddie Olson, and F- Freddie and Kurt used to live down there at the bottom of Brown Lane. Okay. Yeah. What What do you consider your expertise to be in? Well, I had a darn good background and uh, uh, working experienced background in in forestry. I had a lot of forestry courses in in conjunction with the uh, park management mm-hmm. at, at the University of Mass. So I. I won't say I was well grounded because I'm still not well grounded. I'm, I, I I did not get a degree in forestry, but I had a lot of good experience working for Prof- Professor Rich that summer, and I had the the uh, distinct privilege of working with Jeff Smith, renowned conservationist for ten years here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. That's that's my background. So far, I I would think integrating wildlife management with forestry would be would be my strong point. Okay, yeah. so. That sort of means understanding which trees are growing in a certain place and what wildlife need to yes. survive yes. there? Yes, yes, yeah, and manipulating the, the, uh, the environment uh, for, for wildlife. Mm-hmm. Okay, does that include everything from clear cuts and burns to planting new trees? Or Yes, yeah, and, and anything in between. We have not, did you say burns? Yes. Yes, I, we, we have. You don't do that. Uh, at one point, uh, a couple of uh, uh, professors, one in forestry and one in wildlife management at the, from the University of New Hampshire, were working hand-in-hand experimenting with uh, controlled burns, but we never did do it here at Beaver Brook. They came over any number of times. You seem to be familiar with the, with the concept anyways. There's only about four or five days a year that you can safely do that, and it just... It just didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise the fires can get out of control. Right, right, yep. The, the humidity has to be just right, and, and uh, the uh, ground has to be, a, uh, the, the surface material has to be a, a, a certain uh, dry, but not too dry, as you say, so it doesn't escape. Mm-hmm. The wind has to be just such and such. The fire department has to, has to be uh, uh, approved of it and, and, and be around. Uh, the the two uh, professors from UNH uh, had to be available when we were available. It it it, it just didn't work out. Yeah, I can yeah, see the logistics. How yep. How complicated yep. that would be. Yep. When you moved here, what was it like? What did you looked out your window and did you see all sorts of critters? What, what was it? Down like at Brown Lane. Like? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Jeff Smith had uh, spent uh, the uh, previous 10, 12 years converting everything over there to attract uh, all kinds of wildlife, specifically, more, more specifically birds, but uh, gee, we, we saw everything else. Like what? Oh, f- fox, uh, porcupines, skunks, no coyotes then. They came in later. Didn't see any bear until, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Didn't see any moose until 10 or 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. But uh, in any, anything, most anything that was common, we could see certainly deer all the time. When I first moved there, this this place was being rehabbed, and uh, the main office was down there. That building is no longer there, but the, but the main office of Beaver Book was down there to, to Brown Lane. This place didn't exist, so that's where all the activity was. You mentioned a couple of things that have happened that, that we see more of now, the moose, the coyote, the the bear, bear, have, yeah. Have there been any reverses like turkey as well? Those were introduced specifically, but go ahead. So many turkey. Hmm? Have you seen anything where we don't see as many species? Things you're a little worried about? Pileated woodpeckers, maybe, or something else that you just don't see as frequently now that you used to all the time. Hmm. Good question. The only thing that I can think of off the top of my head is uh, the the kestrels. The, uh, when I used to pull on, uh, uh, pull on to uh, Ridge Road off off one twenty two, there by either Rick or his dad's the town's place, they'd always, or typically there'd be six or seven kestrels sitting up there on the wire, looking out over the Nicholas fields, and I haven't seen that in a long time. Although, uh, my bird watching friends say that there, there are kestrels still around. Uh, I, I just, I, I don't go out looking for them. And you're still living in the house down there? I, I live on uh, Toff Road. Where, oh, you're on 
Nartoff. Oh, you're on Nartoff yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you give me a little bit of the history of Beaver Brook? It was started by Jeff Smith and Hollis, Hollis Nichols, Nichols, from Hollis what I Nichols. understand. Can, do, can you just give us a little history? Yeah. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, they were first cousins. And at one point, uh, I think upon the death of his mother, Hollis inherited the uh, what was known as the Lodge up at the end of Love Lane. And... I'm going to back up a little bit and just say I never asked the, some, some of the questions that I should have asked. I never asked, and now I'm asked. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> and, get you, uh, yeah. And darn it. And I'll say, why, why didn't I? But piecing things together, what uh, Hollis and, and Ellen Nichols wrote, and I helped her write the uh, what's in the uh, where the past has been preserved. So I, I, I was able to sit down and glean some of her her, her knowledge. So, as I understand it, Hollis had inherited this, this place from his mom his, and his brother and his sister inherited it. But he was wondering what he was going to do with the lodge. He, he had no intentions of using that. And at about the time, he had just purchased this, the Tenney Farm to, to rehab that. Which is located? Uh, at the corner of... Um, yeah, Mar Merrill Lane and 122. I, I, I guess you'd say it's on 122 rather than the corner of Merrill Lane. At the same time, he was uh, slowing down, hadn't, didn't retire for another 15 years, was at that time a trustee and an alum, as well as the uh, treasurer of Roxbury Latin. And he thought that he would like to make the... Uh, place at the end of Love Lane, quote, the Lodge, uh, and integrated into the outdoor science program at, at uh, Roxbury Latin. So this might, some, something on the, may, maybe an outdoor laboratory type of thing in, in conjunction with biology and, and botany classes down there. I don't know how he and his first cousin Jeff got together, but at the same time, Jeff was selling the Buttonwood Farm right there on, on Main Street. No, by the entrance, the farm that's on right there in the entrance that goes into the new school, and uh, where the new school was all Jeff's uh, land. Been in the dairy business uh, for forty years, and and uh, was worn out, and he wanted to do uh, more in forestry on his land. He'd accumulated about three hundred acres of land, and that's what he really wanted to do. He wanted to do forestry and not milk cows, but. Uh, the forester didn't pay and the cows did. So so somehow they got together and Jeff said to uh, Hollis, uh, I, will, uh, I will work the, the rest of my life uh, for, for Beaver Book Association uh, once, once they get going. So uh, at that point, I think Jeff was a selectman in, in town and he and Henry Hildreth got together and they started putting a map of Hollis together and there were all these missing pieces that they didn't know gaps in the map and what happened to those and they were able to find out that uh, they were probably taken for taxes in the late 1800s by the town <clears throat> nobody knew anything about them and those two located the the deeds and and so on and so forth so between some original donation of the land of the lodge that the Nichols has owned and some of the pieces of land uh, that uh, they were able to get from the town uh, through tax, a, a, a tax sale, uh, Beaver Book started to grow. And that, that was the beginning of it. And what about this piece that we're sitting in right now? This was purchased, <laughs> I think, in uh, Beaver Book was started in 1964. And this piece was bought in 1971 when it came on the market. And it was, it was quite, a, quite, a, quite a purchase. It, it was 200 acres of land. Uh, with buildings, mm -hmm. 190 here and 10 acres down on the Great Meadow off Worcester Road. And where did the money come from? The Nicholses. Did they yeah. have a foundation set up, or they? Yes, yes, okay. yep, yeah. They, they uh, made significant re, uh, uh, donations to the endowment fund, as well as pay for uh, the rehabilitation of this property. And so, uh, probably until the no mid mid 80s. If there was any land purchasing, outright purchasing to be done, the Nicholas's family uh, provided the uh, 
funds for, for doing that. Now, there were a lot of donations. Jeff ended up donating all his land, and there are any number of people in town who, who through the years, had somehow acquired 10 or 15 or maybe even just five acres that was a woodlot in the, in the family. And uh, I suspect because uh, most people knew and respected Jeff a lot and, and knew that he wouldn't be in, in uh, something that uh, was, uh, I don't know, a little underhanded, uh, that they felt very comfortable donating the, the, the land to Beaver Book Association. When they started to piece this together, uh, I can remember that uh, a lot of people were pretty skeptical of uh, what uh, Hollis and Hollis Nichols and, and Jeff were trying to do. You know, they, I, I guess they just couldn't believe that there were people that there were that there were, that were that magnanimous. Uh, they weren't in it for a buck for themselves. They they truly wanted to preserve something to the future, and that just blew a lot of people's minds. And they, you know, what are they up to? Uh, uh, what's in it for them? So why did they do it? Why do you think? Well, I I think it was simple. Uh, neither one of them uh, needed the money. Uh, Jeff was no by by no means a a, a wealthy person, but the, Mr. Nichols and his wife were wealthy people. And uh, I, I think uh, I think all three of them, Ellen and and Hollis Nichols and and Jeff, uh, just felt that uh, they were darn lucky to have uh, had a connection with uh, Hollis when they, especially when they were children, and they had a chance to do something. Uh, Hollis wanted to do something with his money and preserve land, and and Jeff wanted to do wanted to be a part of that. And uh, I think they uh, at the beginning of the conservation movement uh, the early 60s things really got wound up after Rachel Spring uh, Rachel Carson Rachel Carson wrote uh, Silent Spring was that 63 or something like that and then we had the DDT affecting the yes yes the raptors yes the peregrine falcons yep yeah. and uh, and and then I'd never heard the the word ecology and until 1964 or 65 I, I remember giving a ride home from UMass to uh, a, a girl who was also from Pepperell, and I, I remember her telling me she was having a, taking a class in, in ecology, and I said, Joel, what on earth is that? <laughs> also, <laughs> right. Yeah. Also, at the same time, things were changing in the town, though, weren't they? People were started to sell their dairy farms and their poultry farms. That's right. So yeah. tell me what you remember of that. I don't remember an awful lot of it, but uh, but I know... There were some people that specifically wanted to change this town into a bedroom town, and uh, uh, it worked. And uh, as people came in here and were will willing to pay inflated prices for land, the farmers uh, just couldn't uh, afford to, uh, they couldn't grow $10 worth of corn per acre when, when it was worth 20000 or, or whatever. So grain, grain, became a problem. Uh, there was a lot of poultry activity in this town, even up to in, in, into the early 80s. Uh, Joe Archambeau had a tremendous poultry operation. and uh, But it was the, the grain and transportation costs that, that got them. Our energy and it still is probably the highest in the country. Uh, so, yeah, there were a lot of things working against the farmer. I don't think there's any, I'm sure there's nobody milking cows in in town anymore. I, th there might be some beef. I know this one, one family, uh, one family, the Gardner family and Pepper are hanging on with a few milkers. But uh, right. And so, do you think that that Hollis Nichols and Jeff Smith were seeing that as well? And was that part of the motivation too? That's a good question. I I, I don't know that. I'm 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 going to surmise yes, probably. But I never heard Jeff uh, mention anything like that. How many people use Beaverbrook, especially people from town? Do we have any records of that? Use it? Yes. Or are members of it? I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Uh, I guess the simple answer is I, I, I don't know. Boy, and, and this, is a, this is a guess. I would say it's 50% of Hollis residents and 50% not Hollis residents that use Beaverbrook. And I think that... Uh, certainly, the people who take the, the children that partake in, in the education department, 
Uh, I think if you ask Celeste downstairs, I think the figure was somewhere 14 or 15,000 kids came here last year. Wow. Yeah, yeah, they come in on school buses and sometimes it looks like a, a, a beehive with all the yellow buses coming in and out of here. And certainly uh, Hollis doesn't have that. They you know, might send a half a dozen classes over here a year. So the, the people who are using the facilities for uh, natural science education uh, are certainly out of town people. As far as the hikers go, I, I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess and say it's 50-50. The, you... the trails are pretty popular. We've never done a, a study, probably should, I guess just to could... know who our users are. I guess you could look at the membership roles, though, and say what towns are the people coming from, or do you? Do oh, you I think I think the membership and the people who use the trails are two two absolutely distinct things. Yeah. Because people who people lots of people hike the trails, but they don't bother to become members. Yes, yes. Boy, a lot of a lot of our strongest supporters, I know, don't don't use the trails. Uh, they just they just. Don happy to that uh, there's something like Beaver Book in town. Uh, they think it immeasurably uh, adds to the quality of life, and uh, they accept the concept of it's going to take some money and uh, uh, to to manage this land that's been aside, set aside, and and they do it. Yeah, I I think there's a a fairly strong commitment in town for that. So, do you think that half, at least half, of the membership is from Hollis itself? Oh, I think the proportion is probably even bigger than that, the, the membership. Do you know how Beaver Book Works is, is governed? Tell me. Yeah, it's, it's, I find it unique. Maybe, maybe, it, maybe it is, it isn't, but I have, I have never heard of it. First of all, there was a founding group called the Members of the Corporation. Hmm. And they incorporated, and the Members' sole legal responsibility is to elect the board of directors. So you have the, although they do meet more than once a year and they become more actively involved, I won't say in, in, in the day to day, but more actively today than they were 50 years ago. Uh, they, they uh, as I say, they, they, meet, they meet once a year, at least once a year, to fulfill their obligation of electing the board of trustees, and it's the board of trustees that do the hiring and, and the governing and, and, and make policy decisions and that sort of thing. So, as opposed to the Audubon Society or the Protection of New Hampshire Forest, where if you are a member and you've paid your dues, you can go to an annual meeting and talk about the budget and have input on the budget and elect the board of directors at Beaver Brook. The, the public doesn't have anything to say except moral suasion, uh, that, but they don't have anything to say about the expenditures or what the budget is and so on and so forth. So the, the members are actually called friends of, of, of Beaver Brook. Ah, okay. Yep. So the structure is different. It's not a typical 503. Five oh, we are a five oh three C, C. C. Okay. Uh, corporation, but that just means we're, we're uh, nonprofit status for tax purposes. Yes, for federal tax purposes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Oh, oh, your 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 contributions are fully tax deductible because we're a five oh one C three corporation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the structure protects Beaver Brook, I would guess then. In Good. a way. Never thought of it that way. Uh, it ensures that the expenditures, uh, it, it, the oversight of the expenditures is in the hands of a small group of people, much yeah. smaller group of people. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Who I would assume are very tuned in to making sure that this mission mm -hmm. carries mm -hmm. through. Is that mm -hmm. what you're trying to mm -hmm. say? Mm -hmm. And uh, for the most part, they're Hollis residents, but they don't have to be. Uh, our treasurer is, is from uh, Dunstable, for instance. Uh, the vice president is from Nashua. Just, but they have shown they have shown real commitment and to the organization. And the uh, the members take notice of these people. Well, they always ask. The members of of the nominating committee are always asking, who 
who the staff recommends, who 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 is over here doing uh, uh, volunteer work and mm-hmm. and uh, that that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Very heavily invested in it. Yes. Right? Yes. In terms of the expenditures, what percentage of the budget goes to acquiring new land? Acquiring land? Yeah. Oh, uh, boy, that's that that is a good question. For how much have you seen it grow over the years? The the expansion of Beaverbrook. Oh boy, uh, when I came here in '75, oh, I think they'd probably put together thirteen or fourteen hundred acres, but they'd put the easiest stuff together, of course, you know, at the beginning. And we've added another seven or eight hundred acres of, of land since then. Mm-hmm. But the the buying is pretty much over. It's a policy that that we've uh, maintained so far. That's not to say that it's cast in, in stone, but uh, uh, we we probably would not be interested in a piece of land that was not contiguous to what we already have. Makes sense. Uh, that being said, uh, a, a farm was donated to us up in Mil- Milford, and that's any anything but contiguous. Wow. Yeah, we have a, a 200-acre farm that was given to us up there in, in, in Milford. When the, did that happen? The Burns Farm. Oh, I don't know, maybe 1993, 1994, something like that. Okay. Yep. How important and vital do you see Beaverbrook to the town? I wish I was more involved in town politics so I, I knew what... Uh, oh, I'm going to say it's very important. I'll, I'll, I'll bet it's the draw. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the, the years that there was the real real estate boom 70s 80s no no it was it was later than that uh in in, into the 90s before it 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 all crashed but uh at that time uh you would open up the national telegraph on the sunday and there'd be three pages of real estate with with pictures well it's down to one page uh on and in the in the classified section now but uh i i used to start clipping uh specific ads out of, out of the the, uh, uh, the 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 telegraphed just to show uh, what uh, Bieber book meant and a typical real estate ad might say newly renovated cherry cabinets and describe the amenities of the house and if if the the property happened to be contiguous to something that Beaverbrook had, they would already say, backs up to Beaverbrook and 35 miles of trails. Nothing, no description about the house. <laughs> I, I I, have probably 30 ads like that that I, I clipped out. Oh, no, the important thing was everybody knew that it backed up to Beaverbrook. Or, or, the, or the Nistisa River. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Any land over there that the land this district river land trust owned uh, that w- that was another selling point conservation land in your backyard was that was big they didn't even bother describing the real estate this is a very interesting town though isn't it because you have so much town forest oh this is an interesting Cons- town conservation land plus beaverbrook altogether yes i was going to say i blame jeff smith but it's not a blame i, I give him the people like jeff smith henry hildreth I know when they first was were buying land, people like uh, Dick Walker, who was a selectman, was always all, always in favor of conservation land. Anything that Jeff wanted, he probably got. Another strong supporter was Frank Whittemore. Yeah, Brookdale. An, 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 uh, at that time, another selectman. Uh, at, they, I don't know. Was, yes, they probably were. Dick and, and uh, Frank were probably on at the same time, but uh, uh, influential people in town that uh, absolutely liked what uh, Hollis and, and Jeff were putting together. I haven't seen the, the uh, figures lately, but the town's got to be a- approaching, if not past the 25% mark in conservation land. And that's, the, I know that's the F- Forest Society's rule of thumb. Every, every town ought to have 25% of their land uh, 
I, sure. I think at last year's town meeting when they were talking about the two purchases of land, the yeah. Rocky Pond land and the uh, the other piece, I want to say Stefanowitz or whatever it was. Yeah, Stefanowitz, yeah. That they were saw, said if these purchases went through, it would be somewhere between 30 and 33 percent. Oh, that high. Okay, yeah. But one of them didn't go through. Yeah, the, that, that's right. Yep. Yeah, the Rocky Pond one didn't go through. And then I was just talking to the town administrator in Durham, and I think he said because of the university... Durham is the only other town that has a higher percentage set aside. I think it's 40% because of College Woods and the state's involvement mm -hmm. in that. But I think other than that town, this is probably the highest in the state. I, I, I don't know that. I can't even guess on that. But what's going on here? Hmm? What's going on here that so much land is set aside? Oh, I think it was those uh, people in the 60s that... that uh, could see where things are going. Jeff used to say that uh, Beaver Brook is going to become a uh, uh, an island of green in the sea of humanity. Mm -hmm. I like that, uh, and, and I think he's right. If if we aren't already, we certainly are going to be an island of green in the sea of humanity. Do you think sometimes people are lulled into a little bit of complacency because there are lots of orchards still and patches of land where people own it? They're getting older. Yep. We don't know what's going to happen to that land. It's not necessarily set aside for conservation. Which land? All over in town, there are pieces and parcels. Yeah, there are pieces and parcels. But, boy, uh, a lot of the agricultural land has been put into uh, agricultural programs. Uh, all, all of Brookdale's land in, in the center of town, anyways. Uh, I know, I was going to say Kimball's. He doesn't have much uh, uh, orchards in it. The bulk of it's in Massachusetts, but he's he's in an agricultural pre preservation, and uh, I don't know about Lowell Farm. And I don't know about Lavoy. Lavoy, I don't know about them either. Right, mm -hmm. certainly the Lavoy that's uh, using the uh, Woodmont, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's protected. But uh, but but the the Lavoy's on uh, not off. No, I I don't know. Yeah. Is it worrisome? What's that? Is it worrisome at all to you? Because there are some developments going up. There's one on South Merrimack, I just saw a bunch of houses going up there. Yeah, and I it was seems to me there's the amount of houses that are gonna go in there. It yeah. seems to me that the amount of building that's going on now it, there were a couple of years before this year there was nothing and now it seems yeah, all of a sudden yeah, there's more yeah. activity going on. Yeah. Yeah. I I I, I really can't comment on that. I I, I just haven't kept up with what's going on in, in the planning board, for instance. So let's talk a little bit more about Beaverbrook. How mm -hmm. often do you get out in Beaverbrook to How often do I? Yeah. I have something called Charcot Marie Tooth Disease, and that's a nerve de degeneracy. Uh, Makes it hard to walk. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. My, my walking and hiking days are over. Mm -hmm. I, I wish this had taken place five years ago when I spent absolutely the bulk of my time outside but I don't anymore so let's talk about five ten years ago walk around Beaverbrook oh boy let's talk about the beauty of Beaverbrook yeah. what, what do you love about it what do you get here that you can't get anywhere else hmm. what makes it special to you I'm sorry there's such a pause but I uh, it is special to me why, why why is it I never I never really gave it some thought uh, I have some very special places on Beaver Book that I particularly like. Uh, I guess I, I guess it's the the diversity of landscapes that we have here at Beaver Book that's that's been preserved uh, that that makes this place unique. Uh, we've got uh, farmlands and woodlands. Uh, we've got uplands and and lowlands. Uh, east east facing slopes and west facing slopes. We're in a transition zone. Uh, plant-wise, I don't know how uh, climate change is going to affect this, but up up until this point, we're at the northern range of a lot of southern plants. Just just as a for instance, uh, the the flowering dogwood, we're at the northern end of that. We're at the southern end of a lot of northern plants, things like leatherwood and and uh, some some of some of the flowers, and then we've got our whole range of of uh, plants that are normally here. And uh, that makes it special. Maybe it would be helpful because it is audio. I, I, could, I love little stories. One thing that we like to do as we walk 
down the path, we go to the bridge off on the left, and yep. we look over the bridge, and yep. we like to see the fish, the yep. shadows of the fish. Are instance. you talking about the bridge that goes across the swamp? Or yeah. The, or the, yeah. Yeah. Just okay. The, the, yep. Yep. So that is just something we just love to do. We just go there, and we look we look down, and you can see the fish playing around in mm-hmm. the water there. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you have any things like that. Oh, I stories. do. Stories. Go ahead. Oh, I don't know about stories, but uh, there's a place... Uh, there's a little peninsula that's, uh, there's a rock out on it that's uh, almost a natural seat up at the wildlife pond, and uh, I don't get out there anymore, but uh, when I did, I always went over and sat on that stone. It's located in a place where you don't even hear the traffic climbing up on Proctor Hill. Uh, the only sound that you can count on is uh, uh, airplanes. Uh, other, other, other than that, and it's not bad now, airplane noise wise since the Daniel Webster shut down mm. there was, used to be a lot of student flying not that there's anything wrong with that that noise it's nice not to hear it when you're out there and you're looking at some wood ducks out there and swimming around and all you can hear is birds and the sounds of nature that's that's neat and there are several spots in the valley down here that, that's the same way you could almost Almost be at another uh, out on the Rocky Mountains t- type of atmosphere. The the beaver impoundments, no noise except Mother Nature. Can you think of encounters you might have had with animals that stick out in your mind? Not really. I've encountered a lot of them. Whenever I was out in the woods, I always had a chainsaw in my hand, and I was going somewhere to do something, and. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use the word luxury. I, I, I didn't have the luxury of, of, of uh, taking a Saturday afternoon off and taking a camera and going out there and sitting. Saturday afternoon, uh, I, I might be finishing up something that I didn't finish Friday. You know, So a lot of people have seen a lot more wildlife at Beaver Book than I have, even though I've, I've spent many, many, many more hours than most people out, out there on the trails. I get it too, and plus a lot of it happens at five in the morning. That's right. Dusk yep. at times when you just yep. might not be here yet. Well, I can remember one day John and I were working on a a, a bridge over Rocky Pond Brook, and uh, this, this woman who used to always come with a little Jack Russell dog came huffing around the corner, and she said very excitedly, "Did you see it? Did you see it?" And see what? Well, the, the moose, it was it was right there. Well, we hadn't, you know, we were pounding nails on the bridge and so on and so forth. So she, she said that she had talked to a fisherman who used to pack up uh, on, on 130, walk in early in the morning and do some bass fishing. And he said, I always, he, he told her that uh, anywhere from 6 to 6.30, uh, you, you could, generally count on seeing a moose in, in the upper end. Well, for the next morning, I was up there, you know, at, at 6 o'clock in the morning. And, of course, I it never came. I sat there and waited and waited and waited and waited. And, of course, it never came. That's like now in town. All the moose are out and all the bears are out. Yep. And it depends where you live in town, whether you're going to see them or not, I think. What's that? It depends where in town you live, yep. whether you're going to see them or not. Yep, yep. I guess it was last fall, probably during hunting season. But anyways, I... I had turned around, uh, or I was doing something up there by the, the Worcester Brothers Mill Pond, and I got in the truck to take off. I drove about 30 feet, and then I saw a mother bear out in the middle of the road uh, ahead of me. And then two cubs crossed. She stood right in the middle of the road, just as if she was blocking traffic. <laughs> and the two cubs, that was unexpected. And then... And she moved off the side of the road, and all of a sudden, a third one shot out of the woods as if to say, don't leave me, you know. And I've startled and have been startled by things like, uh, not the wolverine, the fisher. Yeah, I, I've stumbled across them. But at about the, about the same time I was startled, it was startled and gone. So I wasn't sitting on a rock and, and, and patiently waiting for it to, you know, do its thing. I think a lot of them are scared of, as scared of us as we are. Oh, right sure. What does, what's your day-to-day job now? What do you do? There's a, a younger fellow, Brandon Radcliffe, who is uh, at least more than my understudy. He's, 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 he's going to take over. 
at, at, at some point, and uh, he already does the bulk of the, the outside work right now. I, 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 I am imparting knowledge to him. I'm trying to keep our, uh, our map mapping uh, up to date. Uh, I do have a, uh, a tremendous amount of history up uh, up here, not down here. So I'm trying to get that sort of thing down, uh, files in order, and and that sort of thing. Now that good weather has has come, uh, I'll I'll go out on the trails and and I'll do some some of the, some of the maintenance. Now I I I can't do it for any more than a couple of hours, and my legs give out. Uh, but I I don't dare go out in the winter time. If if I fall now, I'm done. Yeah. Yep. I, I I I have to I have to keep those muscles working with the Charcot Marie, mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, stave off. It's it's a continually I'm continually declining. Oh really? Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as I keep up the exercises, I I slow down the rate of decline. That's good. So, That's incentive to get out. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but if I slip and fall on the ice, or if I'm walking through snow and I trip on something that I didn't see and I should break something, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I'm laid up for broken hip, I don't know whether I'd walk again. Mm, yeah. What kind of relationship do you have with the other organizations in the area from Conservation Commission in town or whatever it is, committee, to, you mentioned Nisitissit, Nashua River has a... Commission, I yeah, think, yeah, as well. yeah, no, I, I, uh, How collaborative is that? What's that? How collaborative is that? Do you guys talk to each other? Do you work together? I go, I go to all the society, uh, yeah, Society of American Foresters meetings. Uh, I'm pretty, I, I'm, I'm pretty involved. I guess Beaver Book does not belong to a net, a network that meets, meets regularly to discuss things. But certainly, uh, we would cooperate, and uh, others would cooperate with us. If there was, uh, if something came up, the both the Beaver Book Association and the Nisitissit River Land Trust uh, just, I think, did uh, uh, great work working with the uh, Conservation Commission of Bookline this past year, where they pulled off some some neat acquisitions and uh, started to implement a plan of uh, being able to tie some of their other parcels together. Make a real trail, that sort of thing. Oh, that's yeah, nice. Yeah, no, no, this is pretty good cooperation. I'm wondering if something's crossed your mind that I haven't asked you, though. No. No? As soon as you leave, it will right. cross my mind. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Looking back on your time here, well, when do you plan to retire? Do you have a date in mind? I don't want to retire. No? You no. just want to no. keep on doing and what you're doing? I, I do, yep. And uh, at some point... Uh, I will probably feel guilty about taking a salary, and uh, I, I will, but I, I won't stop coming in. No, I've been told I'll, all, I'll always have a desk. No, I have, my, my kids are gone, I'm divorced. Uh, this, this is my family, my vocation and av avocation. So looking back over this career you've had here and this life you've built here, what stands out in your mind? What things are you really proud of? This may sound foolish, silly. A number of years ago, maybe ten years ago now, we 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 meaning Celeste, who's the education director here, got a request from the uh, the fresh air fresh air fund people, and uh, there was a group that was centered in in Westford, Mass. I I think some 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 of the kids went to Drake and so on and so forth, but the core in this area was was Westford, and there were there were probably twenty fresh air kids in, in the Westford area. And they called us and said, uh, is there anything that we could uh, do, do, do for them? Uh, and uh, they'd heard that we had this nice place down at the cabins where we, they, they can have a cookout and that sort of thing. So Celeste and I both said, yeah, we'd, we'd love to participate in something like that. So uh, there was this uh, little uh, black girl who was in my group walking down to the cabins. We get down there early, and I thought to myself, now what am I gonna do with these kids to amuse them in, until the fire dies down enough so that we can roast hot dogs and that sort of thing. So I thought, well, I'll show them some checkerberry and then we'll scrape some uh, black birch bark and I'll find some other edible things, you know, to do. And uh, this little girl was paying intense she was intently intensely paying attention to me 
I didn't realize it until I'd seen somebody had taken some photographs of this. So uh, the next year, she came to the group. And Celeste decided we're going to divide up the group and we're going to have a scavenger hunt on, on, on the way down. That way we can use up a little bit of time and, and they can get some, all of them can get, get a little, little outdoor education on, on our way down. So this little girl, uh, Natasha, was supposed to go with Celeste and she put up a fuss that she wanted to go with me. So they let her go with me. And uh, we got down to within 300 feet of the cabins and she, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith. And I turned around and I said, yes. And she said, can we go to the place that's got the checkerberry? I nearly fell over. She actually remembered the checkerberry. And I don't know why I just, it just, I said, uh, yes, of course. But I don't remember where we, where we found him. Do you? She led me right there. And I said, I, I just almost tears in my eyes and that she had paid that much attention to me. That I think that's the highlight of my. You really touched her. Yep, yep. And she touched me, by the way, very, very much. And then there were other things. Like one day I was sitting here and I heard this racket out in the out on the field over there, and I jumped up to see what was going on. And it was just kids from a poor section of Manchester that were down in here, and they were just having the most wonderful time pushing each other and rolling in the field out there. And I, and it finally dawned on me, they've never had a chance to roll, roll, and roll in a field. They've probably never been in a field, you know? So, and, and that, you know, things like that, that's, that's heartwarming. Yeah, I, I love to see the reaction of the kids that come here. Yeah. How, did, how does nature change children? Oh boy, I'm not much of a philosopher. Now, I once told my brother, he actually thought about things like uh, if, if a tree falls on the forest, does it make a noise? I don't, I don't, I don't care, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I just told him, you know, to provide, provide the money for the trees and I'll, uh, you know, I'll provide the trees. You spend the money so I can, so I can buy them. Well, let me ask uh, you it another but, way then. Yeah. What's the great promise that nature can give us? Oh, boy. Again. How has nature changed you? I don't even know the answer to that, but I know it has. Uh, I'll answer that the next time we talk. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> think about it a little bit? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I've seen a lot of good, and I've seen a lot of destruction. I was just reminded yesterday that it was the uh, 20th anniversary of the uh, ice storm of mm. uh, 1998. That certainly had an impact on me. I won't say it was positive. I can remember the sitting, laying there at bed, uh, listening to all those beautiful oak limbs snapping, sounding like shotguns going off all over my property. And on the other hand, take a day like today and, I don't know, rejuvenates me. Probably you too, you know. Even the bad things, though, I, when I'm snowed in, there's a blizzard, I think, there are some things, it's just such a great reminder that there's some things that are not in your control. Yep. Yep. Nature does that yep. to us. Yep. And you'll have to learn to deal with it. And some people are more successful dealing with it with, with, than others. But yeah, yeah, you're right. And it helps you sort of see your place in the world too, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Looking up at, don't, don't you remember being a kid and you're lying on your back and looking at all those stars up there and thinking, wow, I'm so small. There's something that, uh, I have seen a tremendous difference. Uh, when I was young, I could lay, lay on my back and see the Milky Way, and I haven't seen the Milky Way over, over here in a long time. And uh, I don't know whether that's, it's probably a combination of a lot of things, like air, 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 air pollution. Certainly, Hollis is, is uh, negatively affected by the lights in Nashua. But uh, I'll... We noticed that when we went camping. We went camping in Pittsburgh, State Forest. State Park over in Pittsburgh, New yeah. Hampshire. Yeah. Oh my gosh! All of a sudden, you can see the Milky Way yeah. over there. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. 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 I I go up to Patton, Maine, a couple of times a year. I try to get up there. My my mom, grandfather came from there, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, there's no air pollution. There's no light pollution after nine o'clock at night up there. That that's wonderful. So circling around yet another way to get to this question. People do in this town and elsewhere 
think it's important to preserve a place like Beaverbrook and the other land in town. Why? Why do we need this? Why do we need this land? Why do people want to even live in Hollis instead of Manchester or Nashua? What's so beautiful? What's so great about all of this stuff? I don't know. There's a lot of people that want to live in New York City. Uh, and they, they, you know, they do it on their own volition. Uh, so. What about for you? I assume you would prefer to live in a place with lots of open space. Oh, I, I would prefer. I had to do a paper on, on Nathaniel Macon of the Macon Georgia family. So this was in the late 1700s, early uh, 1800s. And he was, a, uh, I think, a rep, uh, a congressman. But at, at one point he wrote, no, no, man should he, no man should live where he can hear his, hear his neighbor's dog bark. Mm-hmm. And I've always subscribed to that. Now, I don't have enough money to, to, to do that. But if I did, yes, I would live somewhere where I couldn't hear my neighbor's dog bark. And why? I guess because I don't want to hear a, a, a <laughs> dog barking or radios. Uh, I, I, I like Mother Nature. There's a, quite a bit of wetland between my house and, and Flint Pond. I back up to Flint Pond. And uh, right now, the, uh, the, the night is full of peepers and pretty soon it'll be the wood frogs and uh I, you know i'd rather listen to that than a blasting radio it's nice isn't it yeah i just started hearing the peepers a few days ago yeah yeah uh, but last wednesday was the first night that i'd heard them this mm-hmm. year yeah because the weather's been something oh it's late year. yeah i i i don't specifically go out and look for birds or or or, or, or the first flowers but when I do notice them, I, I, I always write it down in my book. And, uh, yeah, well late this year. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Do you worry about climate change? I don't, uh, interestingly enough. I don't think there's anything, I don't think we're going to be able to curb it. I, I think it's, uh, whether it's uh, man-made or whether it's Mother Nature, I, I suspect that it's a combination of both. Because of some sunspots and that sort of thing, uh, we've, we've got a changing climate and uh, certainly if, if we don't have a direct uh, effect, we being humans, on it, uh, we certainly haven't done it any good uh, with, with all our pollution. We should stop our polluting anyways, whether it's causing a climate change or not. No, I, uh, I, I have a daughter who, who, who obsesses over climate change. I, I don't obsess about it. No, I don't. Anything else you want to add? Not that I can think of. You'll leave me with another story? Oh, I'll think of a ton of stories as soon as you leave. Of course. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Of course. No, I've had a a good life. I don't think there's any, I don't, I don't think there's any day that I really regretted coming to work at Beaverbrook. Uh, It's been good for me. I think I've been good for Beaverbrook and I think Beaverbrook's been good for me over the years. And, uh, and I think people have been good for the town. 